Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tom, for those kind words of introduction. Mr. President, members of partners, and to members of Mass General family, let me just say I'm delighted and very pleased and happy to be here. I want to thank these young men from Paul Robeson Institute for Positive Self-Development and thank the concerned black men. And yeah, yeah, thank you also, my friend, my brother, for the wonderful music. Deborah Colton, it is good to see you here. Thank you for extending the invitation. Tom, you saying you must come. Tom for writing the letter. It is good to be here. It is good to be here in Boston. It is good to be here at Mass General. I want to first say that it is, it is wonderful to be invited to come from Georgia to spend a few minutes, a few hours to talk about Martin Luther King, Jr. What he did, what he said, and what he meant to America, but especially to my generation. I said earlier today that I didn't grow up in a big city like Cambridge. <laughs> I didn't grow up in a big city like Springfield. I didn't grow up in a big city like New Haven or Hartford. I didn't grow up in a big city like Chicago or Los Angeles or a big city like Boston or Atlanta. I grew up on a farm 50 miles from Montgomery near a little place called Troy in southeast Alabama. My father was a sharecropper, a tenant farmer. But back in 1944, when I was four years old, and I do remember when I was four, I really do, my father had saved $300, and with the $300, he bought 110 acres of land. That's a lot of land for $300. As a matter of fact, my 88-year-old mother is still living on this land. I was there with my mother, my sisters and brothers, and wife and son and nieces and nephews for Thanksgiving and again Christmas. It was wonderful to grow up there. On this farm, we raised a lot of cotton, lots of corn and peanuts, hogs, cows, and chickens. If any of you come from Boston or from this great state or from Mass General or from Partners and just happen to stop by my office on Capitol Hill, the first thing the staff will offer you will be a Coca-Cola because Atlanta is the home of the Coca-Cola Bottling Company and Coca-Cola provide all members of Congress from the state of Georgia with an adequate supply of Coca-Cola products <laughs> to be made available to our visitors. Every now and then, I may have a, a Diet Coke, but don't tell the Coca-Cola, I'm trying to stay with water, but don't tell the Coca-Cola people I said them. The next thing the staff will offer you would be some peanuts because the Georgia Peanut Commission provide us with peanuts. And we raise a lot of peanuts in Georgia. You know, Jimmy Carter, before he became president, and before he became governor, he had been a, a peanut farmer. I don't eat too many of those peanuts. <laughs> I ate so many peanuts when I was growing up in rural Alabama, I just don't want to see any more peanuts. <laughs> now, Mr. President, I met a staff person who spent some time down in uh, South Alabama near Troy, I don't see her now, uh, but earlier. Uh, and she know the area of Dothan and around there and um, Wilcox County and Selma. They raise a lot of peanuts down there. I used to get on a flight and fly from Atlanta and back to Washington and Washington. They're trying to give me some peanuts. I said, I don't care for any peanuts. I really don't. <laughs> like it. But also on this farm, we raise a lot of chickens. Now, how many of you know anything about raising chickens? Any of you? Well, it's about three hands, maybe four. <laughs> well, you're wonderful. You're wonderful. Mass General is so wonderful. Partners are so wonderful. You help heal the sick. You bind the wounds. You give people hope. 
lot of research. You're doing wonderful, great work. But you don't know anything about raising chickens. <laughs> Let me tell you what I had to do as a young boy growing up in rural Alabama during the 40s and the 50s. To take the fresh eggs, mark them with a pencil, place them under the stead in hand, and wait for three long weeks for the little chicks to hatch. I know some smart doctor, some smart administrative assistant, some smart fella, some smart researcher. Oh, I know some smart person is going to say, John Lewis, why don't you mark those fresh eggs with a pencil before you place them under the set in hand? Well, from time to time, another hen would get under the same nest, on the same nest, and there would be some more fresh eggs. And you had to be able to tell the fresh egg from the eggs that were already under the set in hand. Do you follow me? Yeah. You don't follow me. When these little chicks would hatch, I would fool these setting hens. I would cheat on these setting hens. I would take these little chicks and give them to another hen. I would put them in a box with a lantern, raise them on their own, get some more fresh eggs, mark them with a pencil, place them under the setting hen, encourage the setting hen to stay in the nest for another three weeks. I kept on cheating on these setting hens. And when I look back on it, it was not the right thing to do. It was not the moral thing to do. It was not the most loving thing to do. It was not the most nonviolent thing to do. But I was never quite able to save $18.98 to order the most inexpensive hatchet from the Susan Roebuck store in Atlanta. We ordered everything, our clothing, our wagon, our tools, everything from the Susan Roebuck store. We used to get this big catalog. And some people call it, the young people here are too young. They won't know anything about it. Maybe your grandparents or great-grandparents will know something about it. We used to call that book the ordering book or the wish book. I wish I had this. I wish I had that. <laughs> so I just kept on cheating on this setting here. But as a young child, about seven and a half or eight years old, I wanted to be a minister. I wanted to preach. So one of my uncles had Santa Claus to bring me a Bible. And I learned to read the Bible. And from time to time, with the help of my brothers and sisters and first cousins, we would have church. We would gather all of our chickens together, <laughs> like you would gather here in this hall. And my brothers and sisters, first cousins, along with my chickens, would make up the congregation. <laughs> and I would start speaking or preaching, and some of these chickens would become very, very quiet. <laughs> when I look back on it, some of these chickens would bow their head. Some of these chickens would shake their head. They never quite said amen. But I am convinced, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that these chickens that I preached to in the 40s and in the 50s tended to listen to me better than many of my colleagues listen to me today in the Congress. <laughs> now, the Massachusetts delegation is an exception. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, some of these chickens were a little more productive. At least they produce eggs. And we won't talk about this Congress. That's enough of that story. But when I was growing up there and we visited the little town of Troy, visit Tuskegee, visit Montgomery, visit Birmingham, I saw those signs that said white men, colored men, white women, colored women, white waiting, colored waiting. As a young child, I tasted the bitter fruits of segregation and racial discrimination, and I didn't like it. In 1955, the age of 15, in the 10th grade. I heard about Rosa Parks. I heard the voice of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. on the old radio. And his words inspired me to find a way to get involved in the civil rights movement. I wanted to do something. I asked my mother, my father, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, why segregation? They were says, that's the way it is. That's the way it is. But in 1956, at the age of 16, with some of my brothers and sisters and first cousins, we went down to the public library in Troy, Alabama, 10 miles from my home, trying to get a library card, trying to check some books out. And we were told by the librarian that the library was for whites only and not for colored. But on July 5th, 1998, I went back to the Pike County Public Library. 
for book signing of my book, Walking with the Wind. And hundreds of black and white citizens showed up and they gave me a library card. It says something about the distance we've come and the progress we have made as a nation and as a people in laying down the burden of racism. When I finished high school in 1957, I wanted to attend Troy State College, now known as Troy State University. Submitted my application, my high school transcript. I never heard a word from the college, not one word. I wrote a letter to Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. He wrote me back and sent me a round trip Greyhound bus ticket and invited me to come to Montgomery. On a Saturday morning, September 1957, rather than going to Montgomery, I went to Nashville for school. Uncle of mine gave me a $100 bill, more money than I ever had. Gave me a foot locker, and I put everything that owned, my books and clothing, in that foot locker. Everything I had was gone. And went off to school to Nashville. But while I was there, one of my teachers was a friend of Martin Luther King Jr. Informed Dr. King that I was in school in Nashville. Dr. King got back in church and suggested when I was home from spring break to come and see him. In March of 1958, by this time, I'm 18 years old. On a Saturday morning, my father drove me, me to the Greyhound bus station, aborted the bus, traveled to 50 miles from Troy to Montgomery. A young lawyer, never seen a lawyer before, black or white, met me at the Greyhound bus station. A man by the name of Fred Gray, who had been a lawyer for Rosa Parks, for Dr. King and the Montgomery Movement and drove me to the First Baptist Church, a pastor by the Reverend Ralph Abernathy. I walked inside of the door of the church, into the office, and I saw Ralph Abernathy and Martin Luther King Jr. standing behind a desk. And Dr. King said, are you the boy from Troy? Are you John Lewis? And I spoke up and said, Dr. King, I'm John Robert Lewis. I gave my whole name. I didn't want that to be any mistake, I guess that I was the right person. And that was the beginning of my relationship with Martin Luther King and Reverend Ralph Abernathy, the beginning of my involvement in the civil rights movement. As a student, I continued to study in Nashville. And while studying there, many of us started studying the philosophy and the discipline of nonviolence, studying the role in civil disobedience, studying what Gandhi attempted to do in South Africa, what he accomplished in India that in the Montgomery bus boycott. And from time to time, Martin Luther King Jr., Ralph Abernathy, Rosa Parks, Daisy Bates of the Little Rock Nine, Coretta Scott King would come to Nashville and speak. And then we start sitting in at segregated lunch counters and restaurants, white and black students. And we'd be sitting there in an orderly, peaceful, nonviolent fashion. And someone would come up and spit on us. put out a cigarette, a lighter cigarette out in our hair, or down our bags, pour hot water on us, hot coffee, hot chocolate, beat us. We would be doing our homework or looking straight ahead. Then they, the local law enforcement people would arrest us and not the people beating us. When I was growing up, my mother and my father told us over and over again, don't get in trouble. I got in trouble. It was good trouble. It was necessary trouble because I had been inspired by Martin Luther King Jr. to stand up, to say no to segregation and racial discrimination. On February 27, 1960, the first mass arrest in the city movement took place in Nashville. Almost 100 of us were arrested. The first time I was arrested, I felt so free and so liberated. And between 1960 and 1966, I was arrested and jailed 40 times for sitting in, for marching, going on the Freedom Run to make our country a better place. Just think a few short years ago, when we marched on Washington, for jobs and freedom. When we met with President Kennedy on June 21st, 1963, 
and later the day of the March on Washington on August 28, 1963. All across the South, you'll still have those signs saying white waiting, colored waiting, white men, colored men, white women, colored women. But through our action, and through the action of the Congress, and the leadership of John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson, those signs came tumbling down. And they are gone, and they will not return. A few short years ago, in the heart of the American South, people of color could not register to vote simply because of the color of their skin. They had to pass a so-called literacy test, interpret some section of the Constitution of the state of Alabama or Georgia or Mississippi. On one occasion, there was a black man who had a PhD degree working at Tuskegee Institute now, Tuskegee University in Alabama, he flunked a so-called literacy test. He was told he could not read or write well enough. On another occasion, one parish in Louisiana, a man was asked to give the number of bubbles in a bar of soap. And but one county in Alabama, Lowndes County, between Selma and Montgomery, the county was more than 80% African American, but there was not a single registered African American voter in the county. People have been arrested, jailed, beaten, and some people arrested and jailed for encouraging people to become registered voters. Some of you may recall when Dr. King gave his I Have a Dream speech at the March on Washington. I was the youngest speaker. I had all my hair, was a few pounds lighter, and I was 23 years old. In working on that speech, I've been reading a copy of the New York Times. I saw a group of women in Southern Africa carrying signs saying, one man, one vote. And so in my March on Washington speech of August 28, 1963, I said something like, one man, one vote is the African cry. It is ours too. It must be ours. And that became the theme, the rallying cry for those of us in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. We made a decision to go into Mississippi, to go deeper into Alabama for the right to vote. But on September the 15th, 1963, less than a month after the march on Washington, when there was so much hope, so much optimism, the terrible bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church where four little girls were killed. It was a sad and dark hour for the movement. But we didn't give up. We didn't give in. We didn't give out. We didn't get lost in a sea of despair. We kept a faith, and we kept our eyes on the prize. On October 8, 1963, we had what we call Freedom Day in Selma, on October 8, 1963. And hundreds of people lined up all day trying to get in the courthouse, trying to get in to take the so-called literacy test. And observers came from all across the country, but nothing happened. 63, 64, people got arrested for standing in at the courthouse. Then we went into Mississippi and organized something called the Mississippi Summer Project. The night of June 21st, 1964, three young men that I knew, Andy Goodman, Mika Schreiner, white, James Straney, black, went out to investigate the burning of a black church. These three young men, stopped by the sheriff, taken to jail, later that same night, they were taken from jail by the sheriff and his deputy, turned over to the Klan, where they were beaten, shot, and killed. These three young men didn't die in Vietnam. They didn't die in the Middle East. They didn't die in Eastern Europe. They didn't die in Africa or in Central or South America. They died right here in our own country for the right of all of our citizens to become participants in the democratic process. On July 2nd, 1964, President Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act of 64. He won a landslide election in November 64. Martin Luther King Jr. received a Nobel Peace Prize in December 64. Come back to America, hold a meeting with us. Hold a meeting with President Johnson. Ask the President, uh, uh, suggest to President Johnson that we need a strong voting rights act. And President Johnson tell Dr. King in so many words, we don't have the votes in the Congress to get a voting rights act passed. 
Martin Luther King Jr. come back to Atlanta for the discussion with all of us in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and within his own organization, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And he made a decision to join us in Selma, Alabama, where we have been involved since 1962 and three. In Selma, Alabama, only 2.1% of blacks of voting age were registered to vote. The only place you could attempt to register was at the courthouse. It didn't matter whether you lived 40 or 50 or 60 miles away. The only attempt to register on the third Monday of each month. Selma had a sheriff, a very big man, by the name of Jim Clark, who wore a gun on one side, a knife stick on the other side, and he carried an electric cap rider in his hand, and he didn't use it on cows. He wore a button on his left lapel that said never to voter registration. January the 18th, we mandated lead a group of elderly black men and women to the courthouse just to get inside the door, up the steps to get a copy of the literacy test. Sheriff Clark met me at the top of the steps and said, John Lewis, you're an outside agitator. You're the lowest form of humanity. I looked him straight in the eye and I said, Sheriff, I may be an agitator, but I'm not an outsider. I grew up only 90 miles from here, and we're going to stay here till these people allow us to register to vote. And he said, you're under arrest. And he arrested me along with a few other people. He went to jail. A few days later, in a little town called Marion, Alabama, Perry County, the heart of the Black Belt, about only a few miles from Selma. This is the home county of Mrs. Martin Luther King, Jr. Coretta Scott King, Mrs. Ralph Abernathy, Juanita Abernathy, Mrs. Andrew Young, the late Jean Young, all from this little state. Demonstration took place, a confrontation occurred, when a young man by the name of Jimmy Lee Jackson was shot in the summer, and a few days later he died at the Good Samaritan Hospital in Selma. And because of what happened to him, we made a decision, the movement did, that we will march from Selma to Montgomery in an orderly, peaceful fashion, 50 miles away, to dramatize to the world that people wanted to register to vote. On Sunday, March 7th, at the church, about 600 of us, mostly elderly men and women, and a few young people, after a nonviolent workshop, line up in twos to walk in an orderly fashion from Selma to Montgomery. I was wearing a backpack before it became fashionable to wear a backpack. And in this backpack, I had two books and an apple and an orange. Toothbrush and toothpaste. I thought we were going to be arrested and that we were going to go to jail. So I wanted to have something to read, something to eat, and since I was going to be in close quarters with my friends, colleagues, and neighbors, I wanted to be able to brush my teeth. <laughs> we get to the edge of the Edna Pettus Bridge, crossing the Alabama River. So all of this water down below, the young man walking beside me, named Jose Williams on Dr. King's staff, said, John, can you swim? And I said, no. And then I said, Jose, can you swim? And he said, no. I said, well, there's too much water down there. We're not going to jump, and we're not going back. We're going forward, and we continue to walk without anyone saying a word. And we came to the highest point on the bridge, and down below we saw a sea of blue, Alabama State Troopers. Continue to walk. We came within hearing distance of the State Troopers, and a man identified himself as Major John Cloud of the Alabama State Troopers. He said, this is an unlawful march. It will not be allowed to continue. I give you three minutes to disperse and return to your, your church. In less than a minute and a half, Major John Cloud said, troop advance. And you saw these men putting on that gas mask. They came toward us, beating us with nightsticks, bullwhips, tramping us with horses, releasing the tear gas. I was hit in the head by a state trooper with a nightstick and had a concussion at the bridge. To this day, I don't know how I made it back across that bridge through the streets of Selma, back to that church. I thought I saw death. 
I thought it was going to happen. But on that Sunday afternoon, I do recall being back at the church. The church was full to capacity. More than 2,000 people on the outside trying to get in to protest what had happened on the bridge. And someone asked me to say something to the audience, and I stood up and said, I don't understand it. Our President Johnson can send troops to Vietnam, but cannot send troops to Selma to protect people who only desires to register to vote. The next thing I knew, I had been admitted to the Good Samaritan Hospital in Selma with 16 other people. Early that next morning, Martin Luther King Jr. and Reverend Ralph Abernathy came by to visit me in my hospital room. And Dr. King said, don't worry, John, we'll make it from Selma to Montgomery. The Voting Rights Act will be passed. He issued a call for religious leaders to come to Selma. More than a thousand priests, non rabbis and ministers came and marched to that point where we had been beaten two days earlier. There was one young minister from Boston, several came, but one by the name of Reverend James Reed came, march on March night to the point where we had been beaten, participated in the mass rally. Later that evening, along with three other ministers, they went out to try to get something to eat and on their way back from the restaurant, they were attacked by members of the Klan. They were beaten. And Reverend Reed was so severely beaten, he was transferred to my hospital in Birmingham, and two or three days later, he died. Because of what happened in Selma, there was a sense of righteous indignation. There was a demonstration at every major college campus, almost every major city in America, at the White House, the courthouse, the Department of Justice all over the place. People didn't like what they saw on television or what they read about in the newspapers. The cause of what happened in Selma. <coughs> President Johnson spoke to a joint session of the Congress on March 15, 1965, condemned the violence in Selma, introduced the Voting Rights Act. He started that speech off that night by saying, I speak tonight for the dignity of man and for the destiny of democracy. He went on to say, at time, history and fate meet in a singer plays in man unending search for freedom. For it was more than a century ago at Lexington in that country. For it was at Appomattox. For it was last week in Selma, Alabama. He condemned the violence in Selma. And in that speech, he said over and over again, and we shall overcome. I was sitting next to Martin Luther King, Jr., as we watch and listen to Lyndon Johnson. Tears came down his face. And we all cried when we heard Lyndon Johnson say, we shall overcome. And Dr. King said again, the voting rights side will be passed. We'll make it from Selma to Montgomery. And he was right. The Congress debated the voting rights side, passed the law, and it was signed on August 6, 1965. So today, in the heart of the American South. That's hundreds and thousands of black elected officials. The same university that denied me admission when I got elected to Congress, they had John Lewis Day in the little town. And Troy State University band led the parade. And the chancellor of the university, who had been a roommate, a classmate of Governor Wallace, said, Congressman Lewis, we heard that you wanted to attend Troy State years ago. If we offer you an honorary degree, will you come back? And I said, yes. So a few years later, they invited me back, gave me an honorary degree, so I got my degree from Troy State the easy way. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I make the point I'm making, Martin Luther King Jr. was said to us today to not to give up, not to give in. Don't become bitter. Don't get lost in the sea of despair. That we must keep the faith. That we must keep our eyes on the prize. That we have an obligation, a mission, and a mandate to do what we can to create the beloved community, to create an open society and a good society. After we completed that march from Selma to Montgomery, there was a wonderful group of doctors. 
men and women of medicine. Part of the Human Rights Medical Committee for Human Rights. Invited and made the arrangement for me to come here to Massachusetts General. And I spent almost a week here. The end of March and the beginning of April 1965. I wish I knew the doctor, Mr. President. I wish I knew the nurses. I wish I knew the rooms that I stayed in. And so I want to say thank you. Thank you. You know, if you believe in the spirit of history or believe in some force, call it divine or f whatever you want to, somehow and some way, we're still here. And I said thank you. I don't know. When I came here, I probably never heard of having a lumbar puncture and you sort of put an arch in your back. I remember it so well. They put a needle in your spine or something. I understand you don't need to do that now. But, <laughs> but uh, I left here feeling very good about myself. So it's very moving to come back here 38, almost 38 years later to say thank you. Thank the people here at Mass General, the wonderful people at Partners, and thank all of you, all of you, for this part of America has been so good in standing up and fighting for justice. Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King receive a great deal of their education right here in this city, in this community. I don't know where our country would be without Martin Luther King Jr. I, I said from time to time that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. must be looked upon as one of the founding fathers of the new America. He not only liberated a people, he liberated a nation. This man's message was love. His method was creative nonviolence. His goal was the beloved community. He could speak and the masses understood from his words that there was somebody. This man that I got to know, and I'm not talking about something I've read about in the Boston Globe or the Herald or the New York Times, the Washington Post or the Atlantic Constitution, but this man that I marched with, worked with, and went to jail with, he had the capacity to bring the dirt and the filth from under the American rug, out of the cracks and the corners so we could deal with it. He brought light to dark places. He gave us hope in a time of hopelessness. He taught us how to stand up and say no to segregation and racial discrimination. He taught us how to live and he taught us how to die. He was my friend, my leader, my inspiration, my hero, my brother. Dr. King, if he could speak to us today, he would tell us, that we must use our resources to heal and not to kill. We must use our resources to build and not to tear down. We must use our resources to bring people together and not separate people. I want to tell one last story and I'll be finished. When I was growing up outside of Troy, Alabama, 50 miles from Montgomery, I had an aunt by the name of Steneva. Dr. King used to refer to the area where I grew up as being Four Corners, Alabama. He said, where are you? I said, I'm outside of Troy. He said, well, that's Four Corners, Alabama. <laughs> but I grew up outside of this little town called Troy. I had an aunt by the name of Cineva who lived just a few doors away, and she lived in a shotgun house. I was born in a shotgun house. She didn't have a green manicured lawn. She had a simple, plain, dirty yard. And sometimes at night, you can look up through the ceiling, through the tin roof of the shotgun house, and count the stars. When it would rain, she would get a pail of what we call a bucket and catch the rainwater. 
From time to time, she'll walk out into the woods and take branches from a dogwood tree and tie these branches together and make a broom. And she called that broom the breast broom. And she would sweep this dirt yard very clean two and three times a week, but especially on a Saturday or Friday because she wanted the dirt yard to look very good during the weekend. For those of you who are so young, who lived in urban America all your life, or lived here in Boston or New England, and never seen a shotgun house, let me tell you what a shotgun house looked like in the nonviolent system. In the nonviolent system, a shotgun house, a whole house with a tin roof, where you can bounce a basketball through the front door, and it will go straight out the back door. <laughs> my aunt Steneva lived in a shotgun house. But one Saturday afternoon, a group of my sisters and brothers and a few of my first cousins, about 12 or 15 of us young children, were playing in my aunt Steneva dirt yard. And an unbelievable storm came up. The wind started blowing, the thunder started rolling, the lightning started flashing, and the rain started beating on the tin roof of this old shotgun house. My aunt became terrified. She started crying. She thought the old house was going to blow away. As little children, we all start crying. She told us all to hold hands. We did as we were told. The wind continued to blow. The thunder continued to roll. The lightning continued to flash. And the rain continued to beat on the tin roof of this old shotgun house. And when one corner of this old house appeared to be lifted from its foundation, Aunt Eva had us to walk to that side to try to hold the house down with our little bodies. When the other corner appeared to be lifted, she had us to walk to that side to try to hold this house down with our little bodies. We were little children walking with the wind, but we never, ever left the house. As citizens of America, as citizens of the world, Martin Luther King Jr. would say, we must never, ever leave the house. We must stay together and hold the house together. We all live in the same house. Thank God, Mass General never left the house. Partners never left the house. The health providers have never left the house. You've been trying to hold the American house together. That's the reason we marched from Selma to Montgomery. That's the reason we marched on Washington. We must hold the house together. We all live in the same house. It doesn't matter whether you're black or white, Hispanic or Asian American or Native American. We all live in the same house. We are one people, one family, one house. I said to you today, as we celebrate and commemorate the life of Dr. King, to walk with the wind, Stay with the house and let the spirit of history and the spirit of Martin Luther King Jr. be your guide. Thank you very much.